just FYI. Um, <laughs> we just had a couple of things that we might share later, but not now. But thank you so much for the day so far. It has been spectacular. Those pitches were amazing. And if you didn't see the pictures, the pitches, and if you missed any sessions, we're going to send you the replays. Don't worry. But that's not what this segment is about. This is our entrepreneur panel. And if you did not meet me before, I am Duania, and I'm the founder of Canadian Small Business Women. And I love meeting new people and hearing their stories. So something like this is amazing for me. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we're going to dive into some questions. I want all of you to drop in the chat if you have any questions throughout this segment so that we can, you know, ask our lovely panelists and make sure that we get some answers out of them. So first, I would like to introduce you to Cheryl Sutherland. So she is a transformational speaker, business strategist, and founder of Please Notes, a for-purpose company of affirmation-filled products. And you would have heard of that, about that in her workshop that she just finished hosting. She's the creator, she's, no, she's, okay. Creator Cheryl felt restless and underwhelmed at her nine to five. A lot of us felt that way. After spending over 1,400 hours in learning and facilitating personal development, coaching, and reigniting her inner creativity, Cheryl created a company that inspires women to step into their own power by building confidence, clarity, and creativity. As a women's empowerment expert, author, and entrepreneur, Cheryl Sutherland and Please Notes have been featured in In Style, Huffington Post, Forbes, Fast Company, American Express Open Forum, Thrive Global, Britain Co., Travel Noir, and on podcasts such as The Creative Empire, I Love Success, No Filter with Phil, Phil Palin, and more. Cheryl resides between sunny Los Angeles and sometimes sunny Toronto, Ontario. So let's welcome Cheryl. Hi. <laughs> Every time I hear my bio, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is me. I didn't do that. So thank you. I just needed that little bit of self-esteem. I appreciate that. <laughs> Take it all. It's you. It's you. It's you. <laughs> Now I want to introduce Angie Tran. She is the co-founder of Kind Laundry. Kind Laundry is a purpose-driven company whose mission is to eliminate single-use plastic pollution, polluting our oceans and landfills while providing people with a more eco-friendly laundry cleaning solution. They keep sustainability at the center of every single step of their business operations by offering innovative, greener, and safer ways to do laundry that will help your clothes clean and the keep the planet happy. To date, in less than one year, they have eliminated over 100,000 single-use plastic jugs. So help me welcome Angie. Hi. Saving the planet. Okay. <laughs> now, Kelly Gilchrist has been the sauce boss and CEO of Nona Vegan since 2013. Nona is a dedication to her late Italian mama. She loves sharing love through food by telling her plant-based, by selling her plant-based sauces at grocery retailers across North America. She loves networking with other entrepreneurs, especially young, queer, and or women-run businesses. So let's welcome Kelly. Hello. <laughs> So ladies, welcome, welcome, welcome. And as mentioned before, I really want to start this off with a question for each of you. So we're going to have one person lead a question and then we can all jump in and, you know, give our two, three, four, however many cents on that same question. So first question I want to ask, it's going to go to Cheryl. So Cheryl, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I think we met initially on Clubhouse. We met before Clubhouse. We met before Clubhouse? I just remember Clubhouse. <laughs> we're going to blame my memory on chemo brain. That's what we're doing today. But I remember Clubhouse. But we met before Clubhouse? You're yeah. going to refresh my memory after this question. That's fun. Um, so I consider you the queen of crowdfunding. And you just finished hosting a workshop and you shared some of your tips. But how did you decide this was the avenue to use for your business in particular, as opposed to loans or grants or loans or a personal investment? And give us a few tips for those who might have missed your workshop about what to consider 
when you're looking towards crowdfunding? Yeah, for sure. So first of all, thanks for putting together this panel. I get to be with the sauce boss, Andrew, all these cool people. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a little excited to be around people again. Uh, so in regards to my company, so at the time I actually was working, um, I when I moved to America, I had a visa, I was working for someone great that I quit that and then went to start my business. So not only was I self-funding this business, I was also self-funding myself, right? So it, it just made sense to look at how many different ways can I bring in money that is not going to impact my quality of life and like really like let's stretch this out as long as we can. Um, I know Toronto is an expensive town. LA is also very expensive, not as expensive as Toronto, but you know what I mean. Um, and then also it was it really came down to business strategy. Sometimes I noticed that when I put myself in a corner, that's when I really excel. So really having only 30 days to make it or break it, to sell a product, to make sure people knew about it, it really lit me up and I was able to not only um, communicate with urgency, but then also get other people on board that really loved me, loved what I was attempting to do, um, and was passionate about it. So I was able to tap into a couple different personal growth communities. And they were like, yeah, sure, this makes sense. And then, you know, sold me out. So that was really grateful. I, that was really great. And I'm grateful for it. Um, I think if I was to say one big tip is, first of all, get your messaging really, really clear. What are you doing? What does your product do? How does it support people? What is the, the feeling that you want to leave them with? And then make sure that you continue to reiterate that. And then that's what will allow people to buy into your vision. That is true because that end user feeling like, you know what, it's kind of like that. What makes you like something on social media versus share it? You know, that feeling that makes you want to share. What makes them want to give you that money? Right? I don't know if Angie or Kaylee, if you ever decided that you were trying to find investors, how did that go for you versus, you know, Cheryl did crowdfunding. Did you do any traditional investing? Either one of you. Yeah, I mean, I can hop in. I actually found my first investors from a failed Indiegogo. So if I ever do another crowdfunding, I'm going to definitely hire Cheryl to just help with everything because um, she's an amazing coach and clearly knows what she's talking about with this stuff. Um, but yeah, I was trying to raise, I don't know, a relatively small amount um, considering I didn't know I needed so much money. But anyway, I was trying to raise like 10K or something. Um, and I raised, I don't know, $1,500, maybe 2000, which I was grateful for. I still took it. It still helped. Um, but then one of the folks from that reached out and said, Hey, so you didn't hit your target. And also I think you're going to need more money. Are you going to do a friends and family round? And I said, well, my family <laughs> does not have money nor do my friends. Um, so no. And they were like, no, no, that's just the term for, you know, your first round. And then they said they wanted to, to go in on it. So um, so yeah, I did a friends and family round. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, it, it worked. And the, the other person I met at a networking event and the other person I met through a uh, futurepreneur, actually kitty kins, um, <laughs> call it the cat. Um, yeah. So that was, that was my way. And now I'm, I am looking to do an angel round, uh, sort of in the next few months as well. Uh, so yeah, but again, if I ever have to do it again, if I ever do that again, Cheryl's, you know, you know, obviously going to run that with me for me together. <laughs> Please do it. Do it. <laughs> so for us, we're finishing up our first year of being in business. Um, we're getting to the point where we, we can feel like cash is getting tight. So um, we're learning. I, mean, I have a partner and we're learning about how to raise money and what the options are. Initially, we thought we want to get investors to come on for because um, like everyone's talking about it. Um, you see it everywhere. Um, we feel that pressure. But then after speaking to a few mentors, um, they did advise it may be a bit too early. And if you could self-fund as long as you can, maybe that could be an option. Um, and there are other amazing options. For instance, um, just getting a line of credit from the bank and seeing how to grow that from there. Um, there are other companies like ClearCo and Wayfire, where you can borrow a certain number, like amount, and then they would just deduct that amount from your DTC website or Amazon, for instance, which we're both on. So we're just kind of exploring that right now. But at nighttime, me and my partner were on YouTube, just like Googling, like, what does safe mean? What does seed round mean? 
pre-seed series A, like all that kind of goes over our head right now. So we're trying to kind of learn all the, the acronyms and how that works. <laughs> So those were quite a few different avenues, but I think we all can agree that when we're ready to crowdfund, we're calling Cheryl. Yes, for we sure. That. Yeah, that's another one that I just learned today and I'm definitely <laughs> going to contact Cheryl to learn more about. Sure. You have the inside scoop, ladies. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm know, Cheryl, family. that you're on my CSBW list for anyone who says the word crowdfunding and like, please help. <laughs> yes. This is fantastic. Okay, so we all learned a little bit about how each of our panelists really got the financial components started with their business. So the next one, I want to ask Angie. So there's been a drive towards sustainability and pa in packaging. I cannot tell you the frustration I have when I buy something that's this small and it comes in this much packaging. It drives me bonkers. So that makes up a big portion of our municipal solid waste. So what considerations should be made when we're stepping into the CPG industry, when we're thinking about packaging? How do you source more sustainable material, especially if you're trying to do a lot of your, you're trying to do made in Canada, you know? Yeah. And how do you offset that cost? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, right now there's definitely a, a, like a huge movement with all the governments around the world that are starting to ban single-use plastics and they're trying to encourage people to be more mindful about being less wasteful because we're going through a whole crisis right now with um, too much garbage in the world. Um, in Canada though, specifically, we throw away 3 million tons of plastic waste and only 9% of it actually gets recycled. And I say recycled because plastic never actually biodegrades back into the earth. It breaks down to smaller microplastics that goes back into our drinking water, fish drinks it, and then we eat the fish, and then it goes back into our system, um, which means the vast majority of plastics end up in landfills anyways. And in Canada, specifically around 29,000 tons goes back into our natural environment. And Canada is so beautiful. So it's just um, when I see these numbers and I hear that, it kind of makes us quite sad. So um, the end of this year, Canada is actually banning uh, checkup bags, stir sticks, cutleries, and straws, as well as food packaging. And I think by 2030, um, they're hoping to go, like they they have a mandate um, to be completely zero waste. So that's kind of exciting to see that they have that in place. So for us, um, you know, as a CPG brand, everything that we do from product to even down to packaging, because we're mainly D2C, D2C stands for direct to consumer. So we sell on our website and on Amazon. Um, you know, when you're growing your volume, it's also a lot of packaging that you're sending out. And the most of the shipping packages are plastic. Uh, mailers and that's really really bad so what we did when we did sourcing is that the first step was to go on google um, and see where in the world our suppliers are um, when it comes to making alternative choices um, and to be honest a lot of them is actually in china um, because they're the world's you know top manufacturer they manufacture pretty much everything and then there are some suppliers in canada but if we could spend a bit more and manufacture at home and support another company than we prefer to. So initially when we started, because we had a limited, limited budget, we did this, I'm not sure if you can see this. Uh, so this is this looks like plastic, but it's compostable. So it's made from starch and you can cut them up or bring it to like a local facility and then um, they can compost it for you. But then we found out that people were still kind of confused in Canada <laughs> or like locally, like how to compost it because not everyone has a compost bin. Um, so then we switched to this. So this was sourced in China. And the cost is actually not that bad. I would say it's probably like a few cents more than like plastic. So that's a decision that we made as a company to just invest in um, a more sustainable alternative. And then we found this on Amazon. So Amazon started using these mailers without, because the original one's orange and it used to have a bubble in it. That's not recyclable. So now they found technology where... Um, these things in here that gives cushion actually dissolves when water hits it or they, they scrape it off actually they scrape it off and then they recycle it so we started we found a manufacturer in Montreal that creates these um, so we're changing to this so we're excited about that and then our product so this is manufactured in Canada and then our product looks like this so this cardboard it's um, recycled recyclable 
And so once you use your laundry detergent and you're finished, you can just put them in the blue bin as well. So um, yeah, so consideration is pretty much what country, what vendors source it. And then secondly, how much does it cost? So um, to be honest, on average, it is more expensive than single use plastic. But then we found out that if we just increase the price a bit more for a front end product, people are still fine with it and they're okay to pay a bit more if they know that they can create less waste because they feel like they're making direct impact to the, impact to the planet. I strongly agree. I mean, I shopped for a coffee maker because believe it or not, I don't have a coffee maker in my house. I did not until about a month ago. Strange because I love coffee. I would drink it almost every day, but I wasn't going into, into an office. And the reason I bought an espresso is because their pods are recyclable and they make it easy for you. They literally send you the pods with a recyclable bag that you dump the pods in and just drop it in Canada Post. I'm like, espresso for the win, take my money because you're recycling this. So yes, that does, is something that we all consider. And I see something here, Clarice here wrote, uh, there's a company out of Australia called Better Packaging that have sustainable packaging for exporting. Um, that's good to know. Yeah, um, that's a great company. Yeah, so at least, you know, it's nice to find stuff in Canada because you did find somewhere that makes those packaging in Montreal. That's mm -hmm. good because that's usually a challenge for a lot of people, finding the made in Canada component. Yep. Yeah. Um, Kelly, how do you navigate this packaging world? Yeah, I mean, I have, I will not take up too much time because this is definitely Angie's question and and her area of expertise. But I, like, I'm the kid who when I was 10, I called Bounty, literally their 1-800 number. And I was like, excuse me, why do you individually wrap your paper towel rolls in plastic? Don't you know that our oceans and this was like, 23 years ago, I'm 33. Um, so like, it's definitely when I started my company, I was like, okay, glass jars, no plastic, no this, no that. And then I learned, you know, a lot more about glass and like, and glass production and like how it doesn't always get recycled. And then it takes like 10 truckloads to get the glass because it takes up more room. Anyway, learned all this bad stuff about glass, felt very confused, like, well, now what? So I've, yeah, I've had a really interesting time. We did switch to plastic pouches um, that ship flat. So it's better carbon for shipping. They're a lot lighter. Um, so there's different benefits, but it's still not going to lie. Hurts my heart that it's plastic. And half my inbox has, has been like, I, I emailed this man who made cutlery out of avocado pits in Mexico. And I was like, can you make me bags? So it's definitely on my mind. I actually just got a sample from Hong Kong of these biodegradable bags, finally, that are because it's food has to be hot filled. So most bio stuff melts. Um, but this I don't think will. So I, he, he made me six custom pouches and I'm going to try them. Um, it was on recommendation. I worked with the Sprott School of Business uh, at Carleton on a, an, an environmental project last semester, and the students did an amazing job, and they came, came up with all these good suggestions for me because, yeah, I want to be better. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's been a huge, huge challenge for a food product for me, at least. You know, it's good because at least you are recognizing that you have this one component that you want to fix. And you're doing something about it. I'm ready to, are you gonna keep us posted as to how that works out with the new? 100%, I will keep you posted. That'll be a huge announcement on our social. Once we finally crack that, I'm just, I'm gonna be so happy. <laughs> and then I think you should probably start a partnership with this person once you find out that it works because then you need to connect them with like, you know, Foodpreneur Lab and all these other places, but make sure that there's a partnership there first. <laughs> <laughs> totally good point yes I'll, I'll definitely uh talk to janice and everybody in the in the industry and get everyone set up with it and i will void my 10 percent fee for that okay so <laughs> cheryl so for your packaging like well please note you know those are recyclable right so that part's good and the plus side about you know when you're using certain especially i, I don't know about you all Whenever I buy anything that is like of Cheryl's um, type of goods, I use and reuse and reuse. And do you start turning over and using the edges of every sheet and everything like that? 
recycle is like big, big, big on my mind. When I use any paper products, I will write all over everything. So how is your packaging compared to your product? <laughs> so <clears throat> obviously I'm not as good as these gorgeous ladies here. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity because I'm like, oh, I need to talk to Angie about my packaging. Um, for the longest time, I was like not super invested in taking a look at different ways that I can do things because I'm very, very clear about making sure that the product that I deliver comes to you properly, right? Like I'm concerned about, you know, making sure that it doesn't get wet, making sure that, you know, um, that it's not dented or anything like that. So right now I've been using like padded mailers and all of these different things. And I'm like, okay, well, what can I do? Um, I do attempt to like not have a lot of filler or anything like that. I do attempt to um, even just like taking a look at some of the things that I have, like how do you pull it apart so you can successfully recycle a lot of things? Like, I mean, for me, I always just hang on to my journals. I just finish one and I keep it. Um, but in the off case that you need to get rid of them, like you just rip out the insides, recycle this, and then, you know, it's vegan leather. So you can at least not hurt an animal, but you know, like we all have ways to go. And so even taking a look at some of this, the padded mailers that now we can get that are recyclable, I think it's just super, super important. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we're playing with paper. So it's, it's definitely a little tricky, especially if it comes to being wet. Um, and so I'm excited to, to make some, continue to make some changes. And that's the fun thing about business is like, you could start off here and then next thing you move to like recycled paper and next thing you move to stone paper, which is actually where I really want to go. I just love the user experience of using stone paper. So like, it's just like the little things we're always getting better and we're always elevating. And then having panels like these, now we all just learned something from everyone and, you know, everyone here can help everyone. So I think this can, we're, we're on our way, ladies, we're on our way. <laughs> so I have a question for Kelly. So you have made your way on grocery shelves across North America. That is a big question for a lot of people, you know, because they want to see themselves on those shelves. You want to be able to walk down that supermarket. I mean, I can tell you there was a vendor at our marketplace in February and one of our interns, Varsha, she went to the supermarket and she walked by and she's like, took a picture and sent it. She's like, uh, Yachty's, weren't they just at our event? They're in Loblaws. This is amazing. So, you know, you get that amazing feeling when you see brands that you know on the shelf and they're not like the corporate brands. So what's the process like and what do you have to consider and what are the challenges as an exporter because your stuff is across North America, not just in Canada? Kind of. We're working on our export. I'll, I'll get to that at the at the end. But uh, yeah, thanks. No, it's it's still always so surprising to see it like in Whole Foods when I go in and if somebody has it in their cart, I'm like, you're not related to me directly or or like a friend and you're buying my stuff. I'm sure a lot of CPG founders like you are just founders in general. I'm sure that this is a very universal experience of like, wow, people I don't know are buying my stuff. Uh, so yeah, it still shocks me every time. But I started I was actually working at a health food store here in Toronto, a small one, when I came, uh, when I started the company. So it was really lucky for me. They let me sample my sauce to different customers and see how it sold. And then they, his brother had another store. So then I went there and then a blogger picked it up and was like, hey, you should try these other five stores. And so it was really slow in the beginning. I would rollerblade around Toronto with like a backpacker's backpack from Mech um, full of jars of sauce. And I would just like rollerblade like to the East End and, you know, just silliness. But obviously with food, there's a lot of um, considerations because it's health and safety. People are eating it. So you have to, you know, make sure you have your liability insurance and be cooking out of a commercial kitchen and get your nutritional panels and barcodes and all of that stuff, get it microbiology testing to make sure that it, you know, so you know how long it lasts for and all of that. So early days, I would just cold call companies and be like, hey, I like your soup. Can you talk to me for 20 minutes about business? And uh, and it's so fun because 
I get those calls all the time now. And I'm, I'm always more than happy to chat with people when they call me because that's how I learned the ropes back nine years ago now. Um, and a huge thing for me uh, early days was industry trade shows. And I know that every industry has, yeah, I'm sure there's maybe not a laundry trade show, but you know, like you've got one, I'm sure Cheryl, I know you've gone to ones in your industry. So industry trade shows are awesome because that's where um, if you're trying to get, especially onto retail shelves, like that's where the buyers are walking. And uh, yeah, I was, you know, I always blast electro swing music and just dance like a silly goof. And I was just doing my thing. And this guy came up and his badge was either flipped the other way or he wasn't wearing one, but I didn't know who he was. And I was like, Hey, it's my sauce. Like want to eat it. And I was just being so silly. And then after 10 minutes, he said, well, by the way, I'm you know, I'm in from Chicago. I'm the VP of the Midwest region of Whole Foods Market. Uh, we'd like to bring you in. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I was in the middle of a rebrand and I had only been in business for like a few months. I, it just, it was wild. So that really was a turning point where, um, you know, once you get kind of a big cheese, because I'm in a vegan cheese sauce company, I don't know. Once you land a big account, everybody then, <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> Everybody wants you once you're in Whole Foods. And it was an easy sell. I'd be like, hey, goodness me. Hey, Big Carrot. Hey, everybody. Like, I'm in Whole Foods. And then, uh, yeah, just just uh, go from there. But, um, yeah, we are – so we've shipped a couple skids to the U.S. So North America, it's true. Um, but just uh, to an online retailer. And so logistics with customs brokers. And it's refrigerated because there's no preservatives. So that has been – a logistical uh, difficulty, but we're planning our U.S. launch like proper um, for March 2022. And I've got a great team of U.S. sales brokers. I've got a gal in Austin, Texas, uh, who's pretty much going to be the U.S. me. Um, so I'm working with people who know that market to help me <laughs> navigate it. That sounds exciting. I have a fun question and then a serious question. Okay. Fun question. Do you think that if you knew that guy was from Whole Foods, you would have been as easy in just being yourself or would you have freaked out? <laughs> <laughs> I probably, I mean, I'm just generally a goof. So like, I'm sure I still would have been silly and fun, but like, I would have been nervous because as soon as he told me, then I did kind of switch. Uh, uh, okay, here's my business. <laughs> card here is my pos sell sheet and here is a sample for you sir and i got like really formal and he was you know just so kind and so it calmed me down but yeah good question <laughs> <laughs> just so everyone know we do have an honorary panelist just you know questions will be asked of this honorary panelist <laughs> <laughs> Um, the serious question was, because you're doing a lot of stuff, well, you're planning to launch in the U.S., do you have to do a lot of work with the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and how have they been helpful? Because I know they're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, yeah, I mean, the CFIA, so I have like a compliance gal who does my label compliance, CFIA label compliance. So she's the one who's like, you know, this, this nutritional panel has to be this big and you know your capital letters on your it's like there's so many little intricacies um but for our u.s packaging i'm working with a designer on our fda version because that's like the cfaa in the states so yeah. we have to have totally different packaging for the fda um and then yeah i mean other than that uh and like customs and claiming everything correctly when it crosses the border and ensuring we're working with a good 3pl like third party logistics cold chain in the states like all that kind of stuff um who's been actually like really really helpful uh has been the trade commissioner service if anyone's going to do some exporting like get in touch with these people they want to help they're an incredible wealth of knowledge um yeah they've been so helpful Yes, Trade Commissioner, Export Development Canada, like yeah. they definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to get into some audience questions, but I don't know if Angie or Cheryl have anything to add before I jump into some audience questions. Um, I popped a few quite in the audience questions. It, okay, so I'm going to start. I can choose which one you want. <laughs> I'm going to start at the bottom and roll ourselves up. So the first question I'm going to actually show it on screen, you know, I'm trying to be fancy. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> Candace. Wow. <laughs> stop it. Y'all were <laughs> really nice. Wow. <laughs> Y'all stop it. <laughs> what do you feel your biggest marketing challenges have been since launching? There, the industries feel more niche. So, any one of you, your biggest marketing challenges? Um, I would probably say believing that people actually want to buy my stuff. I think that's always like the biggest challenge and like being able to market from the space of um, this is the specific value that I'm giving you, right? Like even right now I'm going through this transition of, and, and I know that it's really great to be very succinct with like, this is my target market. This is what, you know, this looks like, but when it's your own company, you're just all like, ah, right. So for me, just even saying like that it's more for, you know, entrepreneurs or is it for black women entrepreneurs or is it for like just people that want to feel good? Like, what is this? So I think that has been my biggest thing is just letting myself be OK with being in a very specific niche or um, offering a very specific benefit and just making different verbiages or making different um ways to communicate the value and the benefit that I'm giving people because like, I mean, I'm a Pisces. I'm a little everywhere. Sometimes it's difficult for me. I, I work by myself. So I think that's a, definitely the trickiest thing for me. Well, just in case we're all judged by our signs, she's a Pisces. I'm a Scorpio. What are the other two? I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. Okay, we all work well together. Well, I work well with all of you guys. So like, oh, <laughs> oh this is just wonderful. Hmm, to be. Uh, anyone else want to answer that question? Um, yes, for us, we launched last year in August 2020, literally right in the middle of the pandemic. So we just didn't know what to expect because that's when grocery stores were kind of like had restrictions and people were kind of uh, afraid to go out to buy things. So we had to kind of pivot and go really hard on social media. So what we did instead, because we wanted brand exposure, um, we identified a couple of accounts on Instagram that had over 100,000 followers um, that was in our niche and that had online stores because we knew they had over 100,000 followers. They probably had engaged community and a pr pretty big email list. And um, they're today one of our top accounts retail accounts. So um, yeah, so that's kind of like one of our biggest challenges. Like how do we go out and get exposure um, when brick and mortar is kind of like not like with all the, the changes in the pandemic restrictions, like how do we sell ourselves in the beginning? Plus also um, getting sales organically takes a lot of time as well. So how do we scale as fast as we can the first year um, using paid media traffic? because it's getting very expensive right now, especially now with the iOS changes and all these algorithm changes with Facebook, um, the cell phone, like Apple, and even on Amazon. So kind of finding like being able to have a budget for that and not be, being able to be scared to lose money in the beginning, knowing that people may come back afterwards and rebuy from you. So like the ROI would be there. So, yeah. Wow, a lot of, a lot of good points, yes. Oh. So, Kelly, biggest marketing challenges? I mean, I'm going to just be brief on this because these two ladies are way better at marketing than I am. Um, I My biggest challenge is tying my marketing efforts to my sales because I don't sell direct to consumer. It's really hard to like know whether that Instagram post that got 100 comments actually led to sales through my distributor who went to the retail. Like, It's like an impossible linking map to try to to navigate so I kind of like mark it into the void and hope that it's helping <laughs> generally I'm, I'm working on it so I that's not a very good piece of advice it's mostly just here's my struggle <laughs> sorry it's okay a lot of people might have that struggle and they might need to reach out to you and you guys come up with a strategy together how about that or you ladies I'm gonna stop saying you guys I promise you that <laughs> okay. I have a question here from Clarice. How do you manage customer comments on your product? How do you take the negative and make it into a positive? Yeah. I really love negative comments because I feel like it gives me the opportunity to do something better. They wouldn't, if like, there's so many times where you'll have a horrible experience and you don't say anything, but obviously these people care enough about you or your business to be able to reach out to you, to give you the opportunity to fix it. So it's all in how you reframe it. Um, and I think also understanding that 
I mean, like there's only one or two of us like that are in the business as solopreneurs or entrepreneurs, or et cetera, et cetera. There's only so many things that we can see. So having an extra set of eyes and somebody to be like, hey, sure, I'll like the printing on this is off and like this happened. It gives me the opportunity to fix that, but then also really build um, an evangelist, like really build like a, uh, somebody that's actually going to repurchase my goods, you know, show up for all those launches, tell their friends because they feel honored and respected by me and by what I'm attempting to do. Yeah. My name is Cheryl and I'm done speaking. <laughs> Clubhouse 101. I had to, I had to. <laughs> So who else wants to jump in and talk about their flipping? Because I'm with I'm, I'm with Cheryl. I love a negative comment. I mean, depending on how negative, I also don't really, I, I don't stay mad for long. So if it's something really personal, I'll be like, hmm, I don't like this. But that lasts for like five minutes. And then I'm like, okay, so what do we do to fix this? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I agree. I love, I, I well, okay. So I... Not to brag, but I don't get a lot of bad comments on the flavor of my sauces. Most people like it for the most part. I, and except for the dragons on Dragon's Den. So my worst criticism came when I was in front of na on national TV and they didn't like the flavor. And if anyone's seen me in that episode, I'm kind of just dumbfounded because it was not what I was expecting. So I was like, uh, people always like this. Like, I don't know what to say to you people. It was bizarre. Um, so I like negative feedback when it's helpful and not in on national television. It's okay. Um, They'll replay your episode quite a bit. And every time they replay it, your bank account will show it. <laughs> well, I'm planning my revenge episode. Like once I hit, I don't know, 4 million in sales or something impressive, I'm going to go in with like a team and be like, ha, you were all wrong. Um, yeah, I guess that's how I'm turning it into a positive is like <laughs> plotting my revenge dragon's den. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. You'll get that moment. I mean, I've heard a few dragon's den stories from some friends, so you're not alone. <laughs> Angie. Yes, yeah, so I agree with Cheryl and Kaylee. I love negative feedback. So we brought in a customer service um, VA to help us. And so what she does is she'll sift through all the, the comments on Amazon, our DDC website, and email. And then we have an Excel sheet with all positive comments and then all negative comments based on what the comments are. Um, we're lucky, again, not to have too many negative comments, but I love seeing it because we're always trying to innovate. So we take all that data and then we share it with the supplier to create a better formulation or to develop other products based on their feedback. And we keep all their contacts so that when we do drop another product in the future, we will reach out to them saying that you helped us create this product. So that's kind of fun. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Nice, nice. Uh, I see a question here. I think we have probably like, uh, there are a few more questions and we have about seven minutes. So, okay, I'm just gonna ask the question and whomever wants to answer can answer and then we can just go through the other questions. Uh, Sheila is asking, how do you deal with competition, Angie, with so many companies popping up with the same products? So I know there's a lot of detergent sheets in the market right now, um, but they're not all made the same. So this is our biggest competitor right here. It's very hard. Um, it's smaller and it's mainly based with starch, which is a cheap filler. And unfortunately, 90% of the sheets out there are based with cheap fillers. Um, that's just something that we wouldn't compromise. Um, and we were willing to pay a bit more for that to not have that in our product. So ours is bigger. It only has five simple ingredients right now. Um, no unnecessary fillers, so it's cleaner. So when you drop in the water and dissolve it, you'll see one's powdery and a bit starchy, and then one's just a bit clean. So when customers try different sheets, so they'll notice a difference between all of them. And even though we don't have as big of a budget as our competitors, because they have massive advertising budgets, tons of investors, et cetera, uh, we know we do have a superior product. So they, once they try them out, they just go to the ones that they feel has a better quality product. Okay, okay, let me find another question. Um, one second. Oh, Angie, you got a question up here. <laughs> Which industry trade shows did you go to or what do you recommend? Oh, um, that, <laughs> that was for Kaylee. Yes, yes, that yeah. was me to Kaylee. <laughs> yeah, like um, what industry shows are there? 
My favorite is CHFA that Angie actually would be good for you as well because it's not just food. It's the Canadian Health Food Association and they do an East show and a West show. And it's kind of built after, I think, um, Natural Products Expo East and West in the States. So we're actually going to uh, Expo West this year in March. I'm so excited. It'll be my first trade show back since COVID. Um, and it's like the big industry one in the U.S., um, but yeah, whatever your industries are, like just if you type in stationary trade show, you know, Cheryl, you already know this, but like, or whatever it is, you can find ones. But yeah, CHFA is definitely my favorite or for food restaurants, Canada trade show is another good one if you want to sell food service. Nice. I see a question here from Melody. What are some important steps or advice to get started when preparing to approach retailers for wholesale for the first time? Okay, I love this. Be very clear on your numbers. Um, I uh, actually, when I went to my first trade show, that's when I actually learned a lot. So I went to the National Stationery Show, but I walked it first. So I flew down to New York or up to New York and like checked it out, saw what other people were doing. And I was able to see how are they talking to these buyers? Like, how are they communicating? What is the thing that's making them successful? Like, like, and even asking them, like, how has it been? Who have you talked to, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, so I had, I created a line sheet. So I knew my MSRP, I knew like my wholesale price. And then of course, like that was set up in a way that I would had ability to discount. Like if the orders were a little bit bigger, I knew what my, um, my minimum order had to be in order for you to get like discounted pricing to get the wholesale price, all these different things. Um, even stuff like, and again, depending on what industry you're in, you're going to need to know like your export codes and stuff like that as well. If there's tariffs attached to, you know, you shipping your stuff around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lead times, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then also I think something that's really, really important is just being able to have a follow-up system. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to this trade show and then I'm going to have like so much money and like yeah awesome 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 but most of it all most of the magic is always in the follow-up so being able to take everybody's email addresses put it in a crm like hubspot even if you're just collecting people's cars mark them like abc or like what was the conversation that we were having so that when you go to email them again or like you have like an assistant or you do it yourself like saying hey this is cheryl from please notes it was so amazing meeting you at this particular event um and this is what we talked about and i'm super excited to talk about this is this when is a good time to talk to you um automating as much of it as possible like i had like a calendly link so people can click in and book a time to make it easy so there's less back and forth even giving them something people like the gifts love languages are like gifts so i actually had and I still have some left, these pencils, and I had different pencils because I have three main lines within the brand, um, three main colorways, right? So I have like a pink, a blue, and a black and gold for the Confident Collection. And I was like, okay, like now you get to pick a color. And they're like, what do you mean? And I would give them a pencil and on the pencil, I would have a flag with a bit.ly link so that they can go directly to my website. And they can also go directly to like my wholesale line sheet just in case they lost it, right? So you're just setting yourself up with so many um, points of contact to just be successful successful, but being prepared is super important. Following up is super, super important. Wow. So I think Cheryl just wrapped that up and tied it in a bow for us. Fun. And I see that Kelly did add some details here in the chat. We are down to our two minute mark. And what I would like to do in this two minute mark is for the ladies to just let us know where everyone can find you. And before you do that, I want to thank you for spending your Saturday with us. I mean, I'm not going to say there's anywhere better to be. I mean, this is where the party is. Thank you very much for spending, right? Do the Whole Foods dance, y'all. <laughs> the Whole Foods. The Whole Foods dance. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your insights because I know I got a lot from it and I'm sure everyone out there did as well. And I look forward to, I'm definitely going to go on everyone's website and I look forward to trying a whole lot of everything here. So tell us where everyone can find you. Let's start with Angie. You can find us on www.kindlaundry.com and on Instagram and TikTok at Kind Laundry. Thank you, Kelly. 
Mute. Um, yep, I'm at, at Nona Vegan, N O N A V E G A N, uh, on all socials and then nonavegan.com. And in the refrigerated section of your local health food store grocer. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Cheryl. Um, how am I supposed to beat that? Anyway, so you can definitely find me on Instagram. I'm on there as Please Notes Goods. There's no way you can miss it. And then it's also like my call sign here. Um, and then in stores, if you are in the GTA, if you have been to or plan on going to any of the uh, black owned uh, Canadian or black owned TO stores, I'm in both of the of those centers. And then you can also go to pleasenotes.com. Please is in please and thank you. Notes is in notes of love. And you'll be able to find me and purchase my goodies. And the black owned stores are in Eaton Center and Scarborough Town Center. Correct? Scarborough Town Center. Yeah. All right. So this has been wonderful, everyone. So we're going to stop broadcasting now, but just stay tuned for like two more minutes. We'll be back up because we got to announce the winners. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.